What's up, everybody? It's Jeffrey Lyles. You are listening to Lyles Movie Files with a double shot of Lyles. Joining me tonight is little brother Jace. What's up, man? I'm good. Uh, hoping the uh, weather uh, doesn't scare away the trick or treaters. Uh, uh, still getting over uh, last night's uh, Nats victory. So that was fun. So now we get podcast. So let's get it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, this is a rarity for this area. I mean, it's like we're starting to have champions in the D.C. area, the Mystics, the Capitals, and now the Nationals. It's crazy. It's like, I mean, especially after years of them actually being like, I mean, the Nationals thought of being as a World Series favorite. And then this year it was like kind of like, yeah, they might get in there. And they <laughs> might get to the playoffs. Oh, shoot. They won four games on the road in the World Series. How about that? It's also nuts that no home team managed to win a game at home. How disappointed disappointed are you if you're a fan that paid, they finally got into that super ridiculous lottery to get World Series tickets only to watch your team lose every game at home? See, because like, I was like, oh, I, I'd love to go to see the game here, but, you know, oh, and then they lost. I was like, oh, well, you know, if they lost all the games. I'm sure Houston – eventually he's going to kind of, oh, we're supposed to, we're the favorites to win this thing. All right, well, we got two chances to win it at home. But it's like, they just, it was like complete yeah. opposite world. They're like, nah, home field doesn't mean anything in this series. Yeah, so. two games at home. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like, okay, we had a chump, but we, we have a game we can afford to lose. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's nuts. But you know what happened? The Astros, right before the playoffs started, the Astros were on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Well, it's not like it was uh, the cover of Madden, so... That's true. <laughs> gotcha. Madden, I thought they had no chance. No chance. I know it's, it's like a different sport, so don't worry. Right. So, yeah. so, let's get into this here. Let, let's talk about... We're going to do a special focused episode. We're going to talk Crisis. And we're going to start off talking about Flash and Arrow. And then we're going to kick off what I wanted to do for a minute. Uh, the Crisis on Infinite Earths comic book breakdown. So you started on this journey with me, and we're going to break it down. We're going to do the first three issues tonight, and in the coming weeks, we're just going to tackle maybe two or three as we catch up to the CW's Crisis on Infinite Earths adapt- adaptation. So I am excited to talk to you about all these things. Let's start off with The Flash. I wrote in my review that if The Flash weren't a comic book show, that these performances in this episode, There Will Be Blood, would totally be on the clip for Best Supporting, Best Actor for the Emmys. The acting on it was just out of this world. I'm sitting here watching it, and I'm like watching it on my phone because I'm away in Denver. And I'm just sitting here pausing the screen like, okay, that got really emotional. <laughs> I mean, what is happening here? Um so the main crux of this episode was Barry was trying to work with Cisco because he knew he was having some issues with him going, you know, with his apparent demise and this crisis that's coming and everybody's dealing with it in their own way. But Cisco's like, screw you, Barry. I don't care what you're saying. I want to find a way that you're not to die. And he gets an opening because Nash Wells shows up and he's like, Hey, I'm looking for something and I, I need you to fix something for me, but I'll help you out with this device or serum that you need that could help your buddy Ramsey. And then Cisco kind of pulls him to the side and goes, could it also stop my boy from dying? And Nash is like, of course. And then it comes this really interesting choice where you're kind of like, hey, Cisco, what you're doing is kind of really terrible because you're lying and betraying your friend. But I do understand and I'm not saying you're wrong. What did you think about that? And then we'll break down the other stuff. Well, in terms of Barry has saved that universe a couple times. I mean, he's like, I mean, when it was, a uh, gosh, this movie, man, uh, number verse flash. Uh, but mm-hmm. Zoom, Zoom was about to destroy the multiverse. But if Barry wasn't there and didn't, he, he couldn't do that. I mean, it's just like Barry, you're thinking it's like in a cost benefit analysis, says Barry has saved billions where the nice Dr. Ramsey would uh, help a small number of people with a very rare 
blood disorder, cancer. Just, I mean, I mean, if you just, if you just, we're just talking, like I said, cost benefit analysis, not even saying that's your boy, you're going to make the choice to save Flash. It's like, hey, in the future, he might save more. Like, we don't, we know this blood cancer thing isn't going to be like a thing that's going to repopulate into the masses. So, yeah, probably need to save Flash on this one. So, I agree with him. I think it was, it would have been the call I would have made too. Now, this is probably the wrong time to mention that. If Barry were about to die in this wave of antimatter, somebody with superpowers that could warp from one place to another could be of use? No, no. Okay, okay. No. Just, no. Just, gotcha. just wanted to check. Gotcha. No. Okay. No. Nope. Yeah, absolutely. No. Uh, and then we had another Irish storyline where she's like not wrapped up in what Barry's doing, which is great. And it's really all I've wanted them to do with Iris since what season two when she was actually working in the newsroom. Mm-hmm. So this season, she or this episode, she's helping Ralph get get his mojo back and wanting to work this Sue Dearborn case. And and Ralph was like, "I'm good. I'm I'm I don't see the point of doing anything because I can't even help my boy Barry." And we've talked about this several times, but I'm just gonna act like season four didn't exist and. That ridiculous, stupid bozo, the clown version of Ralph that we were introduced to never happened. And I'm just going to imagine that Ralph showed up one day. Hey, guys, everybody's cool. And he's been a great member of Team Flash ever since. I just I just love how he's not acting like he's Cisco, like uh, he's been best friend, even though I've only known him for this amount of time. But he's taking it hard. He's, just, you know, they're real friends and he needs the patented Joe West pep talk. To help him, you know, just kind of figure things out. And the cool thing was, if you're watching this closely, you see that Joe's not all right with this either. But he's doing what Joe does, and he's just helping. He's pushing through to help everybody else. Where's your take on that one? Well, you know, it was funny. Like, when he first, like, when I was kind of brought in the the suit thing, he really just, like, kind of, it it wasn't just that he brushed her off. It was like, why don't you go deal with your, spending some time with your husband? It was like, Damn, dude! Like, I know it's <laughs> real, but that was a real dick move to do. And then it's like, especially when he, then when Joe kind of came back, it was like he's just angry. It's like, I mean, he actually has found like people who actually can tolerate him, not the old gambling buddies he used to have when he was just shady Ralph. It's like, yo, he actually is a decent human being, and now all of that's about to go. I mean, like the glue that holds this whole team together is about to go. So it's like. Yeah, he should be. He's kind of bending at other people. But Joe West kind of like, nah, man, I, I, that's not that's not what he's doing. It's like he's he's just mad. Like he, he he's lashing out. But no, nah, that's not that's not who that dude is anymore. So I, I thought, I mean, again, I, I think this, I I don't. I, I mean, I think you had, had Jerk Ralph was based on him about to die, but it was still a little overboard. I think this mm-hmm. one's like a dude. It's like this is a guy I would want to say versus like all the rest of those meta humans that they couldn't save, I would have rather save them first versus this guy. Yeah. I mean, remember that guy, but now this guy, you're like, yeah, well, this is a decent dude. I want to look out for him. So, yeah, I think they did a great job. I I mean, like, and I'll give this to them. They started re- rehabbing him, like I said, last week. They I they rehabbed him. Yeah. They we were starting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, honestly, I mean, he was, he was, they did a 180 with him from season four to season five. And they slowly... Because he was just in bad subplots last season, but they really mm-hmm. rehabilitated him. This season, he's involved in good subplots, so the improvements are even better. It's like, oh, cool. Ralph is cool. The subplots are better. I'm really invested in what's going on with this guy, once again. Yeah, because I think it's like just the fact, it's like you were talking about Iris. It's like, it didn't, I mean, even if people didn't like her as a like kind of leader of Flash, it was like, it didn't make sense, actually. It was just like, you're a comms, you're not, you, you really don't have any special skills, so why are you just chilling here? It's like, I mean, you had a doctor, you had a physicist, it was just like, both of the, everybody else can run comms, like, you really, she really wasn't necessary there, and them just deciding, like, you're right, there is no reason for her to be there, other than to support her husband, which is cool, but it doesn't need to be in Team Flash, it's like, yo, like, there's other parts of life that are cool that you should enjoy, and actually gives us also better storyline. So, I mean, again, that was, that was a great help for the season so far. 
Yeah. It's like Iris can have a life, just like any other wife, where she has her career, her husband has her career, and they do their own thing, and then afterwards, hey, how was your day? She was with him 24-7, and it just was like, y'all aren't giving Iris anything. Like, she has nothing to contribute to this Mm -hmm. outside of, hey, our baby girl is... Uh, adult woman now and she doesn't like me because of what happened in an alternate reality I mean, alternate future which she actually forgot the actual plot of the story because she's a kid when this all happened yeah, yeah. Anyhow, I'll, I'll save my bashing for season 4 just I'll put it on the shelf because season 5 has been so much no season 6 has been so much better yeah, say. yeah. Well, okay. five was, five, I mean 5 wasn't bad especially at the end when you saw like reverse flashes of when I'm doing all the Cicada thing, it's like, well, he's just a better villain. Like Cicada was just a maniac, but John didn't really do anything with him. I mean, it's it's like, like they, you could, yeah. Y'all found out and I was like, wait, the way we made this version of Cicada is pretty lame. He's not even like the old dude who's stealing people's lives to get young again or keep himself alive, but like a cult figure. He's just a you know, a mass murderer. It's like I mean, we, yeah, we can't anyway, even... Anyway, yeah, we'll move on <laughs> yeah, yeah. to season, season five. But, so that was that. And Ramsey, I think, has been a really good, much stronger bad guy because we understand his motives. He he starts off with this semi-quasi-sympathetic thing where he's like, I don't want to die. I think a lot of people can relate to that. And he's like, I've got this thing that's going to kill me faster. It's already killed my mom. I thought she gave up when she could have fought. I'm going to fight. I'm going to do what I need to do no matter what I have to do to stay alive. And he's done some shady stuff. In this episode, was a season, I mean, this is episode five. This mm-hmm. is something would have taken another 10 episodes in previous seasons to get revealed for Barry and Team Flash to realize that the bad guy is their friend. Well, the new person that they met this season. When you think about how long it took for the thinker, I mean, <sighs> that took forever. Yeah, so I like this as a real change. Barry had a personal stake in trying to help Ramsey, and it didn't work. Now he knows he's a bad guy. He knows he's creating these zombie uh, people who just kind of disintegrate after he infects and ultimately kills them. And it's totally warped what Barry was trying to do, where it was like, this is going to be my guy that I save before I die. And... Now he doesn't have that focal point, so it's like I've got to stop him before he kills more people. And which, which I think that's the, the good thing is that really helps. Like he's got two, in essence, focus. I mean, focal points this season already. He's like, I know I got to deal with crisis, but I also got to stop this dude, which is far better than trying to go with I got one bad guy that I'm trying to beat, and I'm going to fail for 22 episodes. It, yeah, it feels like a real um, comic book storyline where our character, our hero isn't focused on just one thing. Now, he's not just distracted and kept busy with silly things. Crisis is the end point for where Barry is. He's got to make sure his whole team is ready and prepared for it. He's also got to stop the random bad guys. But he's, his crisis is the finish line. And there's no escape from it. He's not even trying to prevent it. It's just like, this is what's happening. Now, I'm going to be curious if the Arrowverse team has Barry and has Oliver connect before <laughs> Crisis starts, since both of them feel like they have this death sentence. But that's something we can say. I was going to say, because that does, and I'm just trying to remember, like, Oliver, yeah, as far as Oliver's concerned, he's made a sacrifice to save Barry, but Barry thinks he was supposed, he doesn't, I don't even know if he, were, he knows he was supposed to die. He does. Uh, when, when the monitor came the first time. So yeah. he really, he's like, kind of like, and the first time he's seen the monitor, it's like, oh, you're going to die. Like, seriously, like, just, it's over. Just get, be prepared, but you're dying. It's coming, dude. It is so coming for you. Now, so I'm, that, I'm, I'm sorry. I just want to, I'm like, I'm still trying to figure out. I know you, you're not caught up on Supergirl, but Supergirl would ginormously be affected in a positive way just mentioning crisis Especially- and that is the main reason i haven't been watching because i'm getting what i want from the arrowverse with flash and arrow and mm-hmm. supergirl is the other show that should really be all head full steam ahead 
building to crisis and they're not i mean they're acting like it's just the crossover event that they'll eventually get to meanwhile we're going to focus on all these other things that eh, you know maybe we'll care about maybe we don't for me i don't care right now because it's like eh, i want to see lena go off and just perk out for the first episode it's, hey lena i'm supergirl and it just uh, yeah it kind of took some of the steam out for me because i wanted that to be a continual thing where she's still lying six episodes into this season but lena knows but then Leela has this like big like god I, it was like it's almost like that big reveal like i know you've been lying to me for months now i've given you multiple chances to tell me the truth yeah. I mean, like basically like her scene where she blew i mean like it was like kind of like like just that good blow up like i hate you and it's like yeah you got good reason it's like there's it's like again as i always say it's like when they always screw the luthers over it's like they're right like seriously you guys have made them the bad guy but they're at 100 percent right but the hero made him but the mm-hmm. hero made him bad yeah so yeah so that that's the interesting thing now let's talk about the you are dead cold withered a robot if you didn't feel anything watching that scene with barry and joe now we've said so many times that jesse l martin is such the driving force of this show like he is the secret ingredient that makes everything work whether it's those pep talks that he gives barry iris etc he's always been that stable force that makes every scene he's that stable force that makes every scene so much better and this one was amazing grant gustin was like okay i'm gonna be right there with you through this scene I know you always like kill these scenes, but I'm gonna I'm gonna be right there with you. And oh man, Joe going, this isn't fair. How did you know this this shouldn't happen to you? Uh, you're a hero. Don't act like you didn't mean anything. And then Barry going, listen, everything that happened. Iris Team Flash has been great being a Flash, but none of it would have been anything if it wasn't for you. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> What? 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 <clears throat> yeah, uh, yeah, I, I might have to pause this thing. The dust was phenomenal when I was watching that scene. I, honestly, I, I mean, I was thinking, it's like, you're watching that on your phone, you're like, uh, uh, I gotta make sure my cool points are cool, because if any dude sees me here, huh, they're gonna ask me, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> uh, but I, I had it on my big team, like, uh, I'm gonna need as, as much as we said, like, Oliver and Diggle brought it, I think, like, uh, last, uh, like, uh, in, in their scene, mm-hmm. this one was so, I mean, this was better. I mean, it was just, like, phenomenal. And it was just, like, if you had watched The Flash and that was the, if you thought this was the end of Flash and that was the episode right before Flash is over, I mean, I'm thinking that, that's what like, to me, like, that was, like, lost, like, um, at, at the end, at, in the boat scene, yeah, uh, Flash. I mean, I, I mean, that's yeah. how good that was. I was like, oh wow, it's like y'all doing this like five minutes. I mean, if this was really the last season of Flash, I'd be like, yeah, like I don't care what y'all got to do, just show the scene to anybody. It's like, yeah, oh, wow, they brought it was it. so good. And I guess now we can and turn to Arrow. And I wrote in my review that it's so weird how. We kind of assume, I mean, we know that Flash is going to be around after Crisis. But if you were to compare the two shows, it definitely seems like Barry is going to die. His show is about to end. And Arrow is going to keep rolling because he's going to figure something out. Because practically no one's taking what's going to happen to him all that seriously. And so this episode of Wednesday's episode of Arrow had him doing like this random side quest. And it was weird because it was like, this has nothing to do with the monitor. You're just trying to figure out if you can trust him. But I still don't see how you can do anything against the monitor if you figure out you can't trust him. You haven't talked to Supergirl. You haven't talked to Barry, two people who could help you fight him and stop him potentially. You're going, I've got Laurel. I've got Diggle. That's all I really need. So he goes out and he hangs out with Thea for an episode and she's all still fighting the League of Assassins. Talia al Ghul shows up, Athena shows up, and they do this kind of Raiders of the Lost Ark thing where they're trying to find this missing scroll. Then they're trying to find a sword that was 
belongs to the original Ra's al Ghul. And, and Thea and Oliver had a few moments, but eh, I mean, I was like, okay, that's good ish, but she's acting like, yeah, I'll see you later, buddy. Don't yeah. die. Kind of like yeah. a joke. Like, yeah, you'll be good. It was like one of those, like, oh, you're going to die? Oh, we, we got over that before. No problem. We'll find a Lazarus pit. We've destroyed all the Lazarus pit. Don't worry. We got you. It was, it was, and I think that's the, especially after watching Flash, where they had this really big, great emotional moment. It's like his brother and sister, especially after you see how hard he was taking the fact that, like, not having Lord, I mean, uh, Thea in this other world really affected him. It's like he sees the, it was like you were almost expecting this, like, big, like, I, I'm, I'm doing, like, almost stupid stuff to protect you from, I mean, like Diggle was from uh, Lila, like, I'm freaked out by what I saw. Mm -hmm. And it's like, he sees Thea, and, like, see it, he sees Thea in the flesh, he's just like, hey, we're going to go into this little side quest. You want to come with me? Sure. It was like, yeah. I need y'all to bring, it was like, almost I was like, I, I need y'all to bring some a little emotion to this, like, act like, hey, seriously, I am going to die. Like, there is no way around it. Like, I need you to understand, this is goodbye. Like, this is it. I thought Stephen and Mel did a really good job on the mountaintop scene and then in the farewell to Speedy scene. Yeah. But I felt like he was kind of just ice <laughs> operating in a in a bottle where he was the only one that was still like, hey, this crisis is real. I know Diggle and Lila had their scene where he's like, listen, I saw a whole universe disintegrate before my eyes. And it was like, you saw a police station disintegrate, but I got what you're saying. Um. But Lila's like, yeah, Johnny, well, we'll just enjoy what we've got. So, I mean, we, she's foreshadowing because we've already seen that she's with the monitor. She doesn't know what's going to happen post-crisis. So she's wow. like, eh, but we already know. And this is another failing of those future subplots because there's some degree of suspense that we are missing because we know clearly Diggle and Lila have to survive because they've got to raise J.J. and Connor. So we're going to make J.J. crazy. I mean, it was like there. There was a point, but I'm, I'm almost like I don't know if that is true. I mean, it, it it's a a version of the future is like that, but it's like maybe that's like before Barry or that future exists before Barry or Oliver do what they have to do, and it's it's not all set in zone. In, in that future. Oliver is gone. Yes. But I'm not saying there's a, I mean, there's not a future. I, I guess, I mean, it's just, it's speculation. I'm just thinking it's like maybe that future is not the 100% future. Because, I mean, remember we had 2049 and Connor was Green Arrow and there was no problem with the Glades. There was no, everything was trash. And legends, but that is still nine years in that future, or <laughs> nine years from the future, the present future, because Mia and them are operating in like twenty. No, I, I thought know. it was twenty forty. I thought they're operating in twenty forty, but Connor and his Connor's Green Arrow is twenty forty nine. Now I don't know what's supposed to happen because that that had Oliver still, but right. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Yeah, it's like so. Some something has been changed. I am. I mean, Lila, I mean, I think, like, I didn't mind Lila's kind of, yeah, let's play it off, because she was like, I know I'm about to do some real shady shiznit. Yeah. I, I didn't mind that. Yeah. I, I kind yeah. of was like, I understand, it's like, I know the other side of this equation, so I need you to think of this great moment here. I need you to hold that old, little right. nugget and just squirrel it away, because yep. it's about to get real bad. Exactly. Now, the one one part of this episode, and I, this was probably the weakest of the three of this of so far in Arrow, but it, it the tail end kind of kind of saved it, salvaged it for me. Um, the future subplot. I'm just I don't care about Mia, and they have really tried over a year and three episodes, but I just I don't think Catherine Mac McNamara is a good enough actress to pull off this role without going so hard on, I'm so full of attitude. You just got to believe that I'm going to kick everybody's butt. I'm like, you look, you look like you're 80 pounds. And her fighting style just doesn't look as cool as, as gosh, who was, who was the, the, the third Black Canary that was with Prometheus? 
You remember her. I mean, she looked like she could fight. Mia doesn't look like she can. Uh, Prometheus, uh, his traitor within Team Arrow. The, the... Oh, Artemis? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So, I'm kind of like, I just don't buy Mia. I don't buy the rest of the team going along with her just because she's like, well, my daddy was Oliver. You, know, so, you never eh. mentioned daddy. I mean, I mean and you, you were raised by like, uh, what's her name? Tal- not Talia. What's, what's Talia's sister's name? Nissa. Nissa. Like, Nissa was your trainer, but she didn't teach you tactics because you, every time you've done had a tactical move, right. you failed miserably. Yeah, that's what I'm just like. I don't know why anyone would listen to her instead of Connor, who was raised by Diggle and Lila, who were literal strategists, who didn't have any superpowers or abilities. And so they used their brains to overcome that lack and were able to stand side by side with legit superheroes. Well, hey, I guess my here's, here's my thing is. I, I'm hoping, especially if they're going to try to use this kind of as a sub pilot to this new Arrow show, they got to figure out, it's like, she is not the lead. I mean, it's like, I don't know how many years she's been acting, but she needs to kind of season up a little bit. Like, some, I mean, just like a lot of these, like, Stephen Amell wasn't perfect his first season, but he got better. And I think it's like her, she needs a couple more years to kind of get some range because right now she doesn't have it. And it, I mean, it's, and it's not even just how her character is. It's like, Oh, you, you know, karate all. I mean, just like how, I mean, uh, JJ basically punked her out. Like I have no fear of you. I don't have Miracle serum. I have no fear of you. You're not that tough. Right. And that's why you're right, though. In the, se- in the first season of arrow, that's why they put so much emphasis on Susanna Thompson, play Mora. Paul Blackthorne, Quentin, uh, what's my man, uh, John Barrymore, who was Merlin, and, uh, oh man, it's my boy, uh, Calm Salem, who was, uh, you know, his father-in-law kind of stuff. You're talking about, uh, uh, Wal- Walter? Colin Salmon. Yeah, Walter. Like, yeah. they focused on those characters to kind of help him get to that point. But I feel like they're trying to rush and fast forward and still make Mia this this focal point. She's just, man, she's the worst character of the future. I don't like William that much, but he's playing the quirky, nerdy, tech genius that every Arrow show has to have by contract. And he does fine on that. And, you know, they're not like, hey, look, reminder, he's a gay guy. Um, He's just doing quirky. I mean, he, he's every Arrow first tech genius guy so he's whatever um connor I mean, is i think connor should be the leader of this group yeah, that's and what mia I mean. could be you know like hey i want to be the leader but i'm not ready yet i mean it's just like remember how what was i mean like going young I mean, justice I'm, I'm, did with yeah, exactly. aqualad and robin yeah yeah because I, I i guess that that was the thing is like the future subplot doesn't have those and, and i'm hoping that we're, we're, i guess I, i'm I'm not going to foreshadow what happened. I mean, if you saw the episode, you know what happens. But No, nah, let's think, talk about it. So Zoe I, yeah. is dead because she tried to help Mia. And that was terrible because we've never cared about Zoe. They've never done that's, anything with that's future Renee's Zoe daughter. to make her. But that's so Renee's that, daughter. You're supposed to care about her. In the future to make us care outside of, oh, yeah, she's Renee's daughter. She had no moment last season when they focused so hard on the future that made you think that, oh, okay, if she wasn't his daughter, she would be any random character. Okay, and, okay. But, but, but still, we focus, if, going back to years past Arrow, like how Renee was working so hard to get his daughter. You're, I mean, you have a little buy-in from her that, oh gosh, oh that's, oh that's her. Like, oh that's that's me. I mean, that's me. Oh gosh, like, oh no, this is and, this is horrible. I mean, see, but the thing was, they hadn't established future Zoe like Zoe, yeah. anything. It was just like, hey, you remember the girl? She's grown up. She's with him. How did or she here? Beside, I mean, beside me, have they really focused in on any of them? I mean, like Connor, Connor to more of an extent because of his tie to JJ. So he's not revolved in the oh Mia and William, you guys are everything. Like Zoe was such a side character. 
I mean, it's been three episodes, but she didn't do anything. All she was was a, yeah, mm, I don't know. She had nothing to offer. She was just another person swinging and kicking and punching. There's a canary. Yeah, she wasn't doing anything. And there was no, like, oh, I'm so worried about my dad and the rest of them. Uh, What do you guys think? It was just, she was just there. And killing her off was like, okay, here, Mia, you messed up. And now somebody else had to pay the price for your failure. Rico, but, nice again, job. I, I'm, I, I'm. I guess there's the other cool thing is, is if that if that takes, I don't know if she's actually dead. I mean, I think she was dying. Definitely. No, she was she was dead. Eh, but where, they said where, she was dead. But where yeah. we where we in the episode? Things change. Where were they in the episode? Where they they uh, it's the crisis thing where people from one time frame go into another time. That I mean is always not dead. She's so dead. It just means that William, Connor, and Mia are in the present day with Team Arrow. Okay. All right. Well, with that, I and hold I, on I, real fast. Which also made it stupid to kill off Zoe right before Renee gets to see her. You know, it's like, uh, I mean, I guess they're trying to go with the hey, only one person can see their adult daughter being a kicktail vigilante, but I feel like it would have made so much more sense for Renee to see Zoe because he's been working in, we've seen that relationship formed over several years and how much Zoe meant to him as opposed to, uh, let's throw in this random thing with Oliver and Mia. We have no connection outside of, oh, I'm going to meet you up in the future. So you guys oh, Okay, but here, here's, I guess here's the other, the, the flip side is, if Renee knows his daughter dies is a vigilante. He's going to make 100% different choices. He's like, oh, you just lost my daughter. Yeah, she's never hanging out with you idiots ever. Like, oh, was Donna, there's no Auntie Donna at this point. Like, I'm moving out of this because I don't want her to mess with any of y'all. Because you've literally just lost my daughter two seconds ago. Because you're incompetent. So, yeah, that's going to, I mean, it seems like it's a bad, bad call because it's like, Oh, I'm not like all this arrow team arrow stuff. Once it's done, I'm out. I'm not hanging out with y'all. Like my daughter dies because she's messing with y'all vigilantes. I worked too hard to get to this point. I had to work to get my daughter after losing custody of her. I'm not letting her die because she's just, I mean, the way she is right now, she is just another body. It's not like she has made this great save that saved somebody other than saving Mia for two seconds. It's like, well, she needs to learn how to fight better. I'm not. I don't care about her <laughs> as much as I do my daughter. Like screw her. But I was. That's what I say. It was like this plan was so stupid. We're just gonna go after him one more time. It was. It was like it reminded me of the Team Arrow philosophy when they were going against Damian Dark. He whipped us the last six times, but this seventh time we're gonna stop. You know what we're gonna do? The exact <laughs> same thing, and it's gonna work. Wait, did you, you get a secret weapon? Different. Did you all learn a new fighting style? Nah, no. nah, nah. We're just, we're just gonna win. Yeah, this huh? time we're gonna win. Okay, thanks. So she really is Oliver's daughter. If you you had any doubt on that? Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, and she has all the moxie of Felicity. Ugh, yeah. Uh, com- this is such a bad combination. Again, I'm still trying to figure out how she's not. She actually needs William because she is Felicity's daughter most of the time. Yeah. But well, we're we're gonna move past that part. But I, I, I'm, as I was saying. I'm hoping if if they use this time to season, if they're going to do a Arrow spinoff, they need to season Mia with actual adult actors who want, she's not just playing off the kid actor. She needs like people who've been acting in these kind of shows for like years. Like, okay, here's how you hit a mark. Here's how you show emotion. Like, this is the stuff you need to do. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> So, yeah, that that was an interesting one. If I'm going to go toe-to-toe, Flash easily won. I'm glad that Arrow has a focus this season, and the entire lack of Felicity has made the show so much better. And I really wish they had written her off earlier to come back in future installments or future seasons. I feel like what they did with her was what Smallville did not do with Lana. Where after a point, it was like, we got to get Lana out of here. We got to do something else. And hey, you want to leave? Great. We're not going to force you to stay. And it made the show so much better. Arrow would have benefited from losing Felicity back around season four. 
I was going to say, because it's like, because you really don't need, if you didn't know you were going with this future subplot, you could have, it's like, hey, Oliver, I love you, but your life and mine just do not work. You're a vigilant. You are the green arrow way more than you are Oliver Queen. I can't do that anymore. I mean, it's just like when she went to uh, the little paradise land where they actually got engaged, like after Damien Dark, like if they had just sent her there and then Oliver comes back and like, oh, we're just going to do this one thing. And then he keeps going. She's like, no, I'm out. I think the show would have really benefited. I mean, it's like she might have been like an original character you had her on your contract, but it's just like her role greatly hinders everybody else. Yeah. And it's like, and then everybody has to prop her up too. It's like you're, but I mean, it's like Felicity, if you liked her as a character, she was the man, she did everything, <laughs> but the show's not supposed to be about her. It was exactly. supposed to be Green Arrow trying to, hey, it's just like how Team Flash didn't need 9,000 people to say, hey, Barry, turn your arms. Run yeah. faster. What? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. All right. Now, before we get into Crisis, let's talk about the very exciting CW <laughs> potential series news. As the word dropped that CW is actually considering they've got a pilot for Superman and Lois which is going to take a DC rebirth approach on the two characters as parents trying to raise their son, Jonathan, while Lois is the world's most famous reporter and Clark Superman is the world's most famous superhero. And I am 1 billion percent all about watching this show. Um, I, I really thought that the Superman and Lois they have right now, uh, Elizabeth Tullock, and Tyler Hoshlin, Hoshlin are pitch perfect as those characters. Like that is that is like the Margot Kidder successor. I never knew actually existed. And Tyler does such a good job of being the Superman that's not a corny loser, but is self assured, confident, and doesn't have to prop or doesn't need to be propped up for being so awesome and great. And if they have, I mean, if they just do the John dynamic that they did in the comic before Brian Michael Bendis came and trashed it because he didn't have any creativity in terms of how to work with something that was already amazing, it's going to be a great show. They've already got a bunch of Superman characters they can throw in. They've got a Lex Luthor established already in John Cryer. Don't think he's got any, you know, obligations. So he could show up whenever needed. And there's just so many cool possibilities with this i know you're a huge superman fan what do you think about this uh i i'm I, i'm gonna call me a hater but i really think they could just cancel supergirl and put this on um just i mean i, I know you have not watched super but it all they have to do is like because i've been reading like the reverse superman is, was great is was, it, i didn't get to the point where they aged up john but i'm still in that other part it's like it's a really good it's like it's something that hasn't been told and it's like Yo, this isn't corny. It's like, yo, it's like, how would Superman balance being a dad? Like, exactly. how would Lois balance being a mom? And and she's not taking a back seat. It's like, yo, I'm still a reporter. I still want to be in the game. Like, I'm not sitting home now, but I have to watch for my husband to come home. And now my son's getting powers. Like, so I got double the problems. Like, I mean, just like, there's some, there's plenty of stories you can tell on that. I mean, that's something you can do for years if you just come. I mean, just barely just barely scratching creativity because it's like yeah. john is always going to be more vulnerable than superman it's mm -hmm. like just there i mean it's just everything you got it's like and then all these other characters because i mean there's gonna be i mean the truth is there's probably only gonna be one world after crisis is over so all these other characters you got to move and just i mean everything is available so you got those two is those two established and then everybody else can feed it. Anybody can feed into them. Co-star, you can bring someone so back. You can do. I mean, you got everything. So it's like, I mean, especially how weak Supergirl has been this season. I mean, it's like you could actually bring like a true legion of superheroes to them. I mean, you can do everything. It's like just there's so life. much. I feel like you are not the only person <laughs> who said 
cancel Supergirl in the place of this show. I know the ratings aren't as good as CW probably wants. I mean, it's better than some other shows, but it's it's not the show that it was when it first moved over from CBS. Jeff, this show's trash. I mean, I, I mean, it's like <laughs> it, it's it's just it's like there it's it's again it's like we always talk about these CW shows. It's like the less they focus on the main characters, the show the worse the show gets. And it's like last season, I had no issue with that. It's like because there were so many multiple storylines. This season, it's like. They have nothing to do before crisis, and they're not talking about crisis. It's just, it's just it's like, so who's the big bad? Uh, we got Martian Manhunter's brother. Are they still fighting that lady? Yeah. She was lame. I mean, no, no, no. Martian, I said Martian Manhunter's brother. No, but I thought I thought that they had that uh, woman who was doing like tornado blasts or something. Oh no, they 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 didn't. They, she's she's in the Phantom Zone, maybe. Okay. Jeez. We don't know. I mean, it's like. It's it's I can't even say it's like you binge it you're gonna be like man really I should have just listened to Jason Lonnie like nothing just don't I, bother I, I, do, have, I really, really have no interest in watching it and I'm kind of getting close to that on Batwoman not because I think it's terrible but just because I don't feel like it's better or worse than other things I'd rather watch where it's like I know Walking Dead's good. I don't feel like I have to catch up to Batwoman. Like I was, like I said, I was away in Denver and I could watch both of these shows on my t- on my phone and read the recap. And I was like, I want to watch Walking Dead. I don't really have a big interest in watching Batwoman. And I think that is the, the thing. Like in the comfort of my own home, yeah, I'd maybe watch Batwoman. But I didn't feel like I had to watch it. And the show is too early to tie into Crisis to have any meaning. So it's just like, eh, all right, whatever. Her, like I, I think I watched last. I think I watched it and it was like messing me up because I was mad because it's like this pushed me an hour back from watching what because I, I think I ended up watching Walking Dead two days later because I'm like exactly. it pushed me back to watching this which was actually a good show. Right. And this show nothing's happening. It's just like yeah. oh she's learning to be a girl. Oh she sleeps with a whole bunch of. I mean she sleeps with one chick. She didn't sleep with like a whole bunch of chicks. But it's like oh her. A former girlfriend doesn't want to admit she used to be a girlfriend. Oh, this is drama. I'm like, no, it's not. Like, this isn't early '90s where we've never seen girls kiss. Like, no, it's like we're. This exactly. isn't driving. It's like, I mean, oh, this, I mean, it's funny because it's like if you look at the quotes from CW, it's like, oh, revolutionary. Yeah. Oh, just what we need. It's like it's not but, even revolutionary but, within the Arrowverse. Like Sarah is the. I mean, our, our resident lesbian slash bisexual. But no, but I mean, Alex things. had an actual storyline that didn't take it like a joke. I mean, you and I both said that it was a little too convenient that everybody was 100% fine right away. But beyond that, I mean, she had an arc to that, mm-hmm. which developed over time. And I thought handled it pretty respectfully. Um, so I don't know how revolutionary that woman is just because she's the main character. Of a because show. she's the like, lead. But it's like, there's not, I mean... Have they I, watched Supergirl? I mean, to me, I guess may as well be the co-lead in that show. I, I, if if you were, I mean, if you were a new viewer and said, "Hey, I want to watch a storyline," like, you know, I, I, you know, if you were a parent, like, okay, I want to introduce my kid to, you know, some a, a lesbian, a respectable lore, lesbian storyline, because you know, there's some family members we have that are lesbians. It's just like I would just choose Supergirl. It's like because Batwoman is just like. There's just, it's not entertaining. I mean, I guess I was looking at it. I'm like, this isn't entertaining. And I'm, I, I, and it was, I think I texted you after I, I finished watching Batwoman and then Supergirl. I'm just like, I'm cutting both these shows. I'm like, they're just, one is just not drive, not worth delaying an hour. And then I just rather watch Walking Dead straight up, even if I got to watch it. I mean, like, watch that at 10 o'clock just so I can avoid the commercials. Yeah. And just find something else to do with those two hours. I agree. I'm, yeah, all right, so let's move on. Because yeah. <laughs> there's literally nothing else to say about it. All right, Crisis on Infinite Earth. We've been talking about it for weeks. And Crisis has been teased since the very first episode of The Flash. Way back when, six years ago. And Crisis is this big revolutionary 
storyline created in DC Comics to basically clean up the confusion of writers and editors who stopped being able to understand things before Google was a thing. And the real thing was, all right, so basically the editors and writers lost track. Like they couldn't understand where characters fit into the universe. So what they did was the 1930s, late 30s, Superman, Batman, Robin, Wonder Woman, all those characters became Earth 2 characters. And then around, so when the Justice League came out in like the 60s, they made them the Justice League, and that started the Silver Age. And comic book readers understood this. It made sense. It was like, okay, cool. We've got all these different Earths. Or in Earth S, it's the Shazam, the Marvel family. Cool. And Earth X, that's the world where the Nazis one and World War Two is still going on, and Uncle Sam and the Freedom Fighters are fighting the stupid evil Nazis. Cool. But somehow DC editors thought, no, this is way too confusing. These kids can't figure it out. They can't go to comic book stores and get all the back issues to fill in the gaps that make sense of all of this cool story. I mean, I remember going to the comic book store trying to find back issues to fill in gaps in my collection. And every time I did that, I was like, whoa, this is a whole new piece of the story that I never knew existed. And it's incredible. And then DC put out this who's who book where they spent an issue on one alphabet. So they would have, issue one would be the A's, number two, the B's. And they would break down all the characters. And it was a page for most characters, maybe a half page for the lower tier characters. The really important characters like Batman and Superman got two pages. And it was really simple. But for whatever reason, DC was like, all right, we need to clean things up. So Crisis is basically intended as an event to clean things up. Now, this was before every other month, Marvel and DC decided to come up with a new event. This was the real event of events and for two years before it started DC writers had to include a character called the monitor in at least two issues over the course of a year so that meant and we couldn't they couldn't show him they had to reference him and they had to have the monitor doing something behind the scenes so it was really being built up over a long time. It wasn't just a, hey, you know, let's kill this character off and let's build the whole event around it. Crisis had a point. And even though it was like, eh, I mean, I can understand what's happening. And DC has continued to do this, even to the point where I think it's hilarious now. Their TV shows, their movie universes are so screwy and convoluted. They need an overhaul crisis event for their TV movies. That you know, I just think it's funny because it's like all the stuff that they did back in the day, which led to the creation of Crisis, has been done on the TV and movie front, and they need a scrubbing, a streamlined one universe on that thing. All right, so Marv Wolfman and George Perez, the creative team behind the New Teen Titans, which was one of or DC's highest selling book at that time, were kind of got the job to do this. And George Perez wanted to draw to draw it because he wanted to draw every DC character that Wolfman could come up with or remember that they could cram into this book. And New Teen Titan was an amazing book. It's the basis on basically the season of Titans, which has been great. So if you want to read a really good DC book, read New Teen Titans by Wolfman and Perez. The DC Universe app actually has all of Crisis on there. When I say all, it's not just the 12 issues, but the 148 issues that tie in and connect to Crisis. When I told you to do this, what did you think, bro? Yeah, when, when I knew there was all these issues of Crisis, I'm like, yeah, uh, I, I, I got to do a thing, and and I can't tackle that kind of project. But the the fine folks of the DC app had just the 12 issues of Crisis, and I was like, oh, okay, 
I can do I can handle this. So I was cool All with right. it after that. So we're gonna start with issue one because hey, that's where he start with this. And this issue starts off with basically a DC Big Bang. And there's one Earth, and that one Earth explodes into several Earths. And we see the, the multiverse basically come about. And there's a caption early on that says, And a multiverse that should have been one became many. And it's a really ominous kind of, oh, okay. So what we've seen, what we've enjoyed with all these different Earths and all these different characters was essentially a mistake. And this is a mistake that's about to get fixed. And we see it kind of right away. Like we're watching Earth 3, and this is a world where the crime syndicate of America, the evil analogy of the Justice League, has ruled their Earth with an iron fist. They've just smashed, stomped, destroyed everybody that came against them. And occasionally they fought the Justice League and other, like the Earth 2 Justice Society. But this time they're fighting an enemy they can't beat. It is nature gone wild. There's earthquakes, there's lightning storms, there's red crimson skies, and everything is going to obliteration. To obliteration. To obliteration. And there is this white wave of antimatter that's slowly wiping out everything. And we see Superwoman get caught in it. We see Johnny Quick and Owlman get caught in it. And eventually Power Rain and Superman, or Ultraman, I'm sorry, they all get wiped away by this wave of antimatter. But the cool thing is there's one hero on this earth, and he's Alexander Luther, and he and his wife Lois Lane, nice twist, they have a son, and Alexander does not want his son to die. And so this is like this huge analogy to Superman because there's a dying world. This is the first world that we're seeing. So we know how significant this kid is going to be in the story because uh, he's basically a Superman analogy. So if you Alexander, have not read this, it's like you're literally knowing it's like, oh, wow, this is literally Superman story, but in reverse. Yeah. Like, so you, you, your head is already peeped. It's like, oh, this Superman's not in this world it's like and i think the great thing about it is like it starts off as you can tell this is a, a bad world it's like so the superman and green lantern to this world are criminals so oh this isn't just our universe okay got it you're already your your brain's already peeked in like oh this isn't our universe okay good mm -hmm. then you say lex luther and lois oh wow like he's doing the jor-el and lana and uh, lara thing Oh, okay. Well, I would like to see where this goes. Yeah, and where this goes is because Alexander Luther's already encountered the Justice League in an earlier story. He sends his son to the one place where he thinks he'll be safe, the Justice League satellite. But what Alexander doesn't know, this version of the Justice League is gone. They've been disbanded for a while. Justice League is now Aquaman, Martian Manhunter, Gypsy, Vixen, Five, and Steel. And they're not operating in the satellite. They are in Detroit. So there's no one there for his son, who's in this capsule, that's managed to escape this wave of antimatter, to go and be rescued. So he's just sitting in the satellite, and that's all we see for now of young Alexander Luther the third. But it's kind of like, oh, shoot. And another character who we get introduced to in this first issue is Pariah. And Pariah who we learn has been witnessing tons of Earths getting decimated and wiped out. So Earth-3 is not the first one he's seen, but he's cursed with having to transport to every world that's about to die. Watch it die, and then go to another Earth to watch it die. That sounds pretty terrible, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. That's not a cycle you want to see repeated. It's like, oh, I can see everyone on this Earth die. And then I, as soon as it's like, Oh, once it's happened, I'm going to the next Earth, and it's happened all over again. And we don't know how long he's been seeing this. We just know it happened. It's been happening. It's been going on for a minute. So then we finally start to monitor. We don't see this guy yet, but we just see a silhouette. And he sends his emissary. Let's, let's like how Galactus has his heralds. He sends his herald, Harbinger, to go 
start recruiting heroes and villains from throughout the different multiverse for throughout the multiverse to start fighting back against this wave of antimatter and whoever has unleashed it. And Harbinger takes like she she chooses these really weird or the monitor chooses these really weird characters because if you're even just like a, a moderate DC fan, fate of the world's at stake. Who are you calling, bro? Uh, that Superman guy. He's number one draft pick. The rest of the it's like okay, you you. I mean, you're really calling the Justice League. You're like okay, we, we the Justice League. Yeah, I mean, because the Justice League has every power you possibly need. We've got Green Lantern with the ring that can do anything. We've got Superman. We've got Flash, the fastest man alive who can travel through universes, which is going to be a point for later. We've got Aquaman, the king of the sea. Batman, the world's greatest detective. Hawkman and Hawkgirl, a tremendous fighting force in the air. Martian Manhunter, who can do basically everything Superman can and turn invisible and change his shape. And Firestorm, who can change atoms and do different things. We've got the Atom, who can change his shape and go super small. we got Green Arrow and Black Canary, two vigilantes who are basically Hawkman and Black Widow. Um, super assassin kind of characters who, who have a gadget full of arrows, and she's got a sonic scream that can incapacitate even Shazam. So these are who you're going to go for. But the monitor is like, nope. No, that's not who I want for this first round. So he, he takes this eclectic group of characters. He's got Salivar, the king of Gorilla City, uh, Cyborg, Dr. Valeris, Arion, a magician, Earth 2 Superman, who is like, okay, we got our Superman covered. We've got Firebrand from the All-Star Squadron. I mean, it's just these random characters. We've got Geoforce, the outsider. And Simon. it's Simon of the Fearsome Five, who's another Blue villain. Yeah. yeah. And Psycho Pirate, who controls people with his emotions. And that's a pretty good power set, but it's not the Justice League. And we don't quite understand why. The monitor does not explain why he hasn't called Wonder Woman and Batwoman, Batman and even their Earth 2 equivalents around. Why Superman's the only one. And Blue Beetle. They'd already seen like those other worlds die when they have Superman, Batman on their world. He doesn't even have them, so it's like, like, why aren't you just picking their world, Superman and all assorted? You're just getting these random characters. Like we right. got John Stewart here, but at that point, I think like Hal Hal Jordan's probably still Green Lantern. And no, Hal is has retired. He gave up the ring. Okay, John is the Green Lantern of Earth, and not everybody knows that he's Green Lantern's or he's Earth's Green Lantern. So he's kind of got this uh, chip on his shoulder. It's like, look, he gave up the he gave up the ring. I'm Green Lantern, and I can do everything that he did. So lay off me. So he's got this little, had a little bit of an attitude, but it's an understandable one. And also Killer Frost, who is one of Firestorm's, maybe his arch enemy. Which Psycho Pirate has to manipulate to get on the team. No, he manipulates her emotions that to make her love Firestorm. Yeah. And instead of trying to kill Firestorm, she's now madly in love with him, which is a weird twist. But it, it, it was, it's kind of, I mean, it's one of those things where in the Me Too era, it's like, oh my gosh, a dude manipulated me. But back then, it was like, eh, okay, whatever. It's kind of funny. It, it's love because, potion number nine. Yeah. Like, but it's, but the, almost like, the also foreshadowing is, it's like, wait a minute, this dude can make somebody go from 100% trying to kill this person to exactly. 100% in love. Like, I don't know, I mean, like, I'm, I'm going to date myself, but like, anybody who saw that, uh, Tales from the Crypt, where the girl kills herself after a bit. It's like, that one still sticks with me. Like, uh, nah, I don't need any love potions. Like, nah. But that girl oh, yeah. follows me. I, I kill, I'm dead. And she's yeah. all broken up and coming for me. Now I'm good. Uh, I'm find you. Yeah, so it was, it was really cool. And again, there's a lot of foreshadowing. Marv Wolfman, I mean, you can tell he didn't just kind of come up with this on the fly. Like, he is thinking every page and every character through. And there's so many characters here. And he's got their voices down without making them sound like if you took away the arrows or the balloons pointing to them, you'd understand exactly who was saying what. 
Like they don't sound alike at all. Like Earth Two Superman is very heroic. He's the the modern day inspiration hero. And there's no doubt that he is that iconic hero. Cyborg is kind of a dude, Simon, you better watch yourself, dude, because I don't I have time for you and we can get this thing on right now. Uh, Dr. Valeris is really arrogant. He's a bad guy, so he's acting in character. And Arion is this magic, he's a magical character, and he is very much in awe of things. Salivar is wise, and we've got Blue Beetle, and this is my first introduction to this guy. And I'm thinking, is he basically the DC version of Spider-Man? Which is kind of true. Uh, Steve Ditko created him as well, but he's a different character, and he's very unique, and we kind of see that play out through Crisis. So we've already figured out. All right, we got these guys who are gonna live, and they're all hanging out in the monitor satellite. And all of a sudden, these shadows start appearing out of nowhere, and they attack the heroes. And it's like, what's happening? Did the monitor set us up? Why did he set us up? What do we even have in common that he would need to set us up? But the monitor makes his big arrival. A big flash of light, so all the shadows disappear. And he's like, I'm the monitor. And we are going to, you're going to be my start to save the the multiverse. What do you think about this as a kickoff to this episode? I mean, to, to the entire series. Don't go further, but just as an opening issue. Well, it's an opening issue. You're just like, this is, again, you're, you're just initially like, because you've probably been, at this point, you've been reading comic books for a while. And you're just like, this is the most random team ever. I don't even understand how their power sets work and complement each other and why you got the bad guys here and why you only got two bad two or three bad guys like okay um but then you see i mean especially if you had been reading i guess the earlier stuff you see this monitor dude like i'm the monitor like okay so why'd you set them all up at the end just to kind of punk them I me mean, just to show your superpower so I, it, it was like okay all right well you got my attention for episode one Issue one. I know we're doing the TV so often. It's hard to off. All right. So issue two is when things start heating up. And this is where, this is when you kind of get the sense that Crisis is going to be a totally different series than anything you read before. Now, Mar Wolfman and George Perez did not bring in Superman and Batman in that first issue, which is kind of a, a tease and a hint of how important Crisis is that they can delay the two big guns. From DC in the first issue but they do show up in this one and the first time we see Batman it is a horrifying traumatic scene Batman is going after Joker and Joker and Batman are both kind of exchanging a few puns this is not the super know-it-all oh I'm doing this so this means that Batman is just always in a pissy mood like somebody pissing his cornflakes um he's still kind of hopeful optimistic and he's got joker and joker and hammer kind of going you know doing their back and forth joker kind of gets him stuck in a trap and he's about to get out and all of a sudden this nightmare vision shows up and both of them recognize the person that's there it's the flash but he's fading away before their eyes and he's warning them about something happening and it's like everything's dying you've got to help help me and then he dies before your eyes Batman, of course, is traumatized because it's one of his friends, one of his Justice League uh, teammates, and he just watched him die, and he couldn't do anything, and worse for Batman, you know, this is something that other guys would never do, but modern Batman, he's like, what happened? Or modern Batman would be like, uh, what's this? What's going on here? Current Batman. No, like, modern Batman would have been like, I've already deduced what this is. Yeah, exactly. Clearly, this is what happened. But old school Batman is like, huh, I don't know what's, what just happened to my buddy. So then we've got the monitor, and he's sending off all these guys. He's sending off his his 15 heroes and villains to all these different worlds. And we still don't know what the heck is going on, where they're supposed to be going. But we do know that Psycho Pirate's like, ooh, I get to go play with people's emotions. And the, the monitor sent them all to different Earths, different time frames. And, the, and Psycho Pirates just totally goes rogue. And he starts screwing around and making people panic and 
fear, fearful and angry. And well, Psycho Potter's Psycho Potter's been in prison because he's crazy because the the Medusa mask makes him want to do this. So it's like as soon as he gets his toy back, he's like, oh, and no one who's no one here where he's put in this new Earth can stop him. So it's like, oh, I get to play and no one can stop me. So I'm gonna go like a a maniac. Yeah, but his maniac run comes to an end real quick because he gets teleported away, kind of in the same way the pariah was whisked away in the first issue. But this time, he's going to a much darker place, and he's going to a place where there's this dark silhouette who is clearly evil because the caption boxes are in black and with a white lettering as opposed to the other way around. Which is really like, cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you you can hear the creepy, like, nail scraping against something, like, psycho pirate. I, you know, it's like, oh, shoot, who is this guy? And we still don't know who he is. And it's just like, we're not going to find out for a while. So the shadow demons start popping up, and they're starting to fight our heroes. And Superman meets up with Batman and, and Batman tells him, look, dude, <laughs> this is not something's not right. Our boy Flash got vanished away. What's going on? And then there was another big part that happened where the Guardians, the, the crew who runs the Green Lanterns, get taken out. Now, this is something that gets paid off later, but... Taking the Green Lanterns out of the field right away is a major move. And did that kind of stand out to you? It's like, uh, okay, what are y'all doing if y'all knock out the Guardians that fast? Yeah, because, I mean, like, the Guardians, are, like, is, these are guys who run the Green Lanterns. And I don't remember if they were as powerful as they have been, like, after kind of Jeff, uh, Jeff Johns got them. But, if Jeff, I mean, just if they were anywhere near that powerful, you're like, wait, who just took the Guardians off? The, I mean, who took him off the map in like five seconds? Like these guys were gonna be like, if everything goes real bad, we'll handle it. Like we we don't like to intervene. We got our whole our troops, but if everything if if the crap hits the fan, we'll we'll t- we'll 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 come in. They're taking off the board in five seconds. You're like, uh, who's powerful enough to do that? This is again you, the the anticipation's there. You're like, oh shoot, like this isn't a joke anymore. Like we've seen the world get wiped out. We see the Guardians knocked out. We don't know what's going on. And then this crazy dude is like talking in black and white lettering. We don't we don't know anything. Right. So now it's time for issue three. All right. So that's going to be where we're going to leave off on this episode. Jace had some serious computer issues, so he's going to get those squared away. And I figured with two issues down, that made a good break point to wrap up talking about Crisis for this one. Uh, We will be talking more about Crisis in the next couple of episodes as we break down issues three, four, five, six, etc. As we count down to Crisis, which is coming in almost a month time now. So stay tuned. Thank you for listening to this episode. This episode allows movie files has been filed.